Hey fellow explorers, I recently came back from a seven day epic road trip seeing three of the most amazing canyons in the USA. And in this video, I've compiled the best things to see, do and eat along the way. Oh, and of course the best place to stay too. The first canyon we're gonna visit is the Grand Canyon, one of the seven natural wonders of the world. And since I'm starting this road trip in Las Vegas, we're gonna first hit up the close to Vegas Grand Canyon West to walk out on the Skywalk. That's a 10 foot wide horseshoe shaped glass bridge that extends 70 feet out over the rim of the Grand Canyon where you can look down to see breathtaking views 4,000 feet down to the canyon floor below. Then we're going to visit the Grand Canyon National Park, the second most visited national park in the USA and definitely one of the USA's most iconic attractions. I'll spend three nights in the park itself, split between the most historic hotel, a cabin at the Bright Angel Lodge, to the fanciest hotel, the El Tovar. And I'm going to attempt three of the Grand Canyon's most popular hikes. Then we're going to continue on to Bryce Canyon in Utah, home to the world's biggest concentrations of hoodoos, which are these really interesting rock formations that have been chipped away by freezing water, the water turning into ice, breaks off chunks of the rocks and turns them into these really unique shapes. After hiking Bryce's most popular loop trail, we'll continue on to Zion National Park, the third most popular national park in the USA, right after the Grand Canyon. At Zion, I'm going to stay at the only accommodation in the park itself, the Zion Lodge, and we'll check out Zion's two most famous hikes, Angel's Landing and the Narrows. And finally, we'll conclude the road trip by returning to Las Vegas to stay at the Venetian Hotel and celebrating New Year's Eve with fireworks on the Strip. All right. Let's go. And my first stop about 45 minutes out of Las Vegas on Interstate 11 is this scenic overlook. It's a beautiful viewpoint to check out Lake Mead. You can also combine this trip with a visit to Hoover Dam. I'm not going to because I got a lot of driving today. And so let's get on to the Grand Canyon West. So after a little more than an hour from that viewpoint, as I turned off the highway onto the one lane road that goes to Grand Canyon West, I was treated to like all of these amazing Joshua trees. I had no idea, but it looks uh, like just as cool as Joshua Tree National Park. There's even some like hiking spots that I saw on the side that you could like get off at to see these trees. They remind me so much of a Dr. Seuss book. All right, and after two hours of leaving my hotel in Vegas, I made it here to the Grand Canyon West to the tent that is the check-in where you show them your tickets and then you get on a bus to actually get to the Skywalk. But it's a big parking lot. There's a whole bunch of like tour buses here. People have come on a tour. There's an airport back there. And there's a little helipad over here because apparently if you don't want to drive here from Vegas, you can take a helicopter. Maybe next time. Okay, let's go inside the tent and see what's in here. You go in through these rotating doors front check-in desk to tell you what time it is because interesting Arizona is a one-hour time difference right now from Nevada snack shop restrooms uh, gift shop and shuttle buses over there and some people saying Merry Christmas because today is in fact Christmas Day happy people here and turns out I bought my tickets already online so I'm just gonna head out here to the bus how much did this whole thing cost uh, $70 for admission to the place and the Skywalk. And because it's Christmas Day, I don't think it's too busy. This looks like it can be a pretty long line sometimes, but today it looks like it's a walk right on the yellow bus. How did they know I was coming? Again, okay, after a quick five minute bus ride, I am here at the first stop, Eagle Point, dressed significantly warmer, home of the Skywalk in that building right here, and of course the Grand Canyon West. Now it turns out this is not the same Grand Canyon as the Grand Canyon National Park. It's like a finger part of the Grand Canyon that's owned and operated by the Hualapai Native American tribe, not the National Park Service, which is why the prices are different. And my first reaction is it's like Disneyland. Uh, Disneyland by the canyon. There's so many people out here, even though it's Christmas Day, but everybody's having a great time join the view, so let's get closer. Oh, and I guess to make sure people don't get too close here, they've actually got some uh, chains set up, so you can only take pictures about five foot from the edge, but from what I can see here, deep, wide canyon, quite immense. You know how people often describe the Grand Canyon is indescribable, 
but I look forward to seeing how this compares to the one that the National Park Service operates, too. Oh, and everybody out here is under the watchful eye of the security guard to clearly make sure nobody does anything too crazy. Now, after admiring that view of the canyon, I'm admiring the view of the line. This is the line to get on the skywalk. Uh, I don't know. I guess maybe the reason why nobody was in line for the shuttle bus is everybody was here in line for the skywalk. All right, and after about 45 minutes of standing in that line, they finally called me up into the building. So here we go up into the entrance for the skywalk. And so now that I'm in the building, it is the next line. Oh, I wonder how long this line's gonna be. It really feels like Disneyland. There's the outside line and there's the inside line, but what's one gonna do? You know, I drove two and a half hours to get here, so I guess I'm gonna be in this line. All right, so after about 20 more minutes in the inside room, they called me up, took my ticket, put me in the locker room, where they then told me I couldn't take any pictures in the locker room. I don't know why lockers don't like their photos taken of them, but you have to store all of your stuff in the locker before you go out on the skywalk. They actually send you through a metal detector to make sure you don't have any metal, which means no phones, no cameras, which means I can't show you what it looks like on the skywalk. But after the metal detector, you put on booties and then they send you out to the skywalk. Well, they wait until a photographer is available to send you out into the skywalk because one of the other ways they make money here is taking photos of you. How much are the photos? $25 if you want one, $50 if you want the four pictures they take of you. And I'm a sucker, so I bought the four photos. Here's what they look like. They might look like the thumbnail for this video, and I figure, what am I gonna come back here? And I'm here by myself, and I don't have anybody else to take a picture of me, so that worked out well. Now, going out on that skywalk was pretty awesome because I could see all the way down just how steep it is, something you can't see from the edge right here. You can't really like see all the way down. You can't really take in the immenseness or the deepness or the steepness of the canyon. You can see the Colorado River from up there. Uh, and then you can see straight down through the glass, which is cool too. There were definitely some people that were like afraid of heights that were like shuffling around on the edges that wouldn't let go of the handrail. That was sort of funny to see. Uh, but when I was up there, I also realized why this is called Eagle Point, because they want to take a picture of me in front of the Eagle uh, formation and then I look out in the distance and see, oh, that rock actually looks like an eagle, which I didn't see right at the beginning when I got off the bus because I wanted to quickly get in that super long line. Uh, so anyway, if you're coming here, make sure to plan for a line, uh, you know, hour, hour and a half, something like that, uh, so you don't uh, schedule yourself too tight. Okay, so after that Skywalk experience, it got me hungry and uh, the lines for the Skywalk restaurant up there were a disaster. So I came out to Hualapai Point, which uh, you actually drive to once you're done with the whole Grand Canyon West main part, and came to the Native American restaurant where for $25 I got the Native American taco on fry bread with beef, chicken, <clears throat> lettuce, cheese, some salsa, beans underneath the meat, and a drink for that price. And so this thing, you know, just looking at the pictures, I asked them, I'm like, how, you, know, you can't tell how big it is on a picture. I'm like, how, how big is it, you know? And she's like, well, um, honestly, it, it generally feeds two. I've never had a taco this big, this creative. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to use a fork or a knife, but I'm just gonna go this way. And if you do wanna check out this restaurant, they're open for breakfast starting at 9 a.m. and they close a little before six. And after a quick five minute drive, it brought me over here to this pretty small parking lot. In comparison to where I just came from, there is like nobody here. Uh, this is definitely like the newer attraction, I would say. There are signs that say general admission required, but there's nobody here to check tickets. Maybe if it's busier. Uh, it is like an old Native American town. Over here, there's uh, the zip line office. You can rent bicycles. There's a restaurant down here that we'll check out in a minute. There's a hiking trail off there in the back. There's a gift shop restroom. There's a shooting gallery right here. And finally, you can stay at cabins at the Grand Canyon West. There are these rustic cabins. They start at about $200 a night. Uh, they also have RV hookups around here. Those are about $20 a night. And uh, they also operate a lodge, the Hualapai Lodge, but don't confuse it because it's actually about two hours away from here near the Colorado River. Great if you're going for a rafting expedition, not great if you're here to see the actual Grand Canyon West. 
All right, well, after that filling taco, it is time to bid Grand Canyon West. Adios. I'm now on my way to the Grand Canyon National Park, getting in my rental Nissan Altima right here. Uh, four hours driving, and uh, but I need to go now because I've got dinner reservations at 8 p.m. for Christmas dinner at the El Tovar Hotel. See you there. After about three hours of driving, I needed to get some gas, and when I'm driving kind of in the middle of the U.S. on the highways, I always look for Love's. Love's is a big truck stop gas station. Gas prices here in Williams, Arizona, the turnoff to the Grand Canyon, $2.99. And because it's a truck stop, they have these like gigantic things to wash your windows with, uh, good for an RV or things like that. And inside in the convenience store, always clean restrooms. And they've also got everything a trucker would need including flashlights, uh, fast charging cables. They have a whole set of premium Bluetooth headphones over here, including some that are like $250. And over this way in a pinch, they've even got showers back over here. Oh, and because you might be going to the Grand Canyon for a hike, they've got wooden walking sticks, 15 bucks. All right, and the good news is I made it to the El Tovar just in time. So this is the most historic hotel in the Grand Canyon. This is the Grand Dining Room, the most high-end dining at the Grand Canyon. They have a special Christmas menu. Uh, lobster bisque and prime rib looks good to me. All right, the lobster bisque has arrived. Let's give it a try. Mmm. Hot, creamy, quite delicious. A good start for a solo Christmas dinner at the Grand Canyon. By the way, it's really anticlimactic to come to the Grand Canyon at night. There's a, that's a window out there that looks at the Grand Canyon, and right now it's just a big dark thing. All right, the prime rib arrived. I've already cut a piece because I can't hold my camera and the prime rib at the same time. Let's see how this tastes. Mmm, warm. Tender, juicy, everything you want in a prime rib. Good, real mashed potatoes. And healthy asparagus. And because I'm a complete and total glutton, I decided to top it off with a slice of red velvet cake. I think I'll be doing a lot of hiking tomorrow, so I've got calories to burn. And it's Christmas, so it came with a cute little Christmas treat chocolate. After dinner, I explored the El Tovar a little bit. This is the oldest hotel at the Grand Canyon, and the property just looks really neat. Like, the lobby has an old lodgy vibe. I'm gonna be checking into this hotel tomorrow night, but tonight I'm staying in the Bright Angel in a cabin, so let's go check that out. Okay, and here we are to the Bright Angel Cottages. They are these little cottages that are either one, two, three together. I am in room 6185. There are three cottages in this building. Come on in and let me show you around. I already unlocked the door, so that's why the door's open. It is a small, oh, that was loud. It is a small, cozy room. It's got one queen-size bed, two headboards. It's got the door that, like, it's a double door, so you can detach the top part and open this up and just close the bottom part. That's interesting. Even when the door's closed, it has a screen door, so that's kind of unique. Uh, in the room, there is a mini fridge down here, coffee machine, ice bucket, connecting door. This is a connecting room. There's a mirror right there. It's cold outside. It's like 27 degrees. The closet is right in here. Uh, there's a, looks like a heater on the floor in case it's too cold in here. Safe, small television, um, something to tell you about the Maswick food courts where you can get takeout pizza. And then the bathroom is over here. A charming little bathroom, small tub, uh, small sink, toilet over here, window that you can look out of, and one fixed head up at the top. All right, now that I'm all settled into the room, I decided to turn on the TV to but check out the news, or in this case, Guy Fieri, but take a look at, like, the bad reception, how pixelated that is. I mean, they must be still using, like, antennas to pick this up. I don't know, but I guess no TV for me. I'm just going to turn in early, and I'll see you tomorrow. All right, well, a beautiful Grand Canyon morning to you today. The Grand Canyon now is not a big dark thing at uh, 9 a.m. here. It is quite beautiful, and, you know, something really cool about sleeping where I slept, which is in these cottages, like, right, right here, 
just to give you a sense of perspective, the Grand Canyon is right here. So I'm up in the morning. I mean, nine's not that early, but you know what? The crowds aren't here yet. It's just me and the Grand Canyon and a little bit of a commune. There's a trail right here. This is the Bright Angel Trailhead. So that's a pretty convenient spot about staying in these Bright Angel cabins is you can like wake up and walk 50 feet to get on the Bright Angel Trail. All right, I'm hungry. Let's get breakfast. Oh, now you might be saying to yourself, Chris, what's with the beanie? How cold is it? It's really cold. I, I mean, I don't know the exact temperature, but below freezing, there was, there was ice on the roof of my car when I went to put some stuff in it this morning. <sighs> All right, so for breakfast, the restaurant at the Bright Angel Lodge, way too busy, long line. So I came over to the Alto Bar and got the pancake trio. Same dining room as last night, a little brighter today. About 15 bucks for this. It comes with a prickly pear syrup and score. I got the seat in front of the fireplace. All right, 11 a.m. Checkout time, so I've checked out of the Bright Angel Lodge. And now I'm gonna go hike the Bright Angel Trailhead since the lodge is right in front of it, it makes sense. This is one of the most popular hikes down into the Grand Canyon. I've got my hiking sticks and I'm ready to go. And so are all these other people over here. Now, this is one of the trails that the mules go on. You can book a mule to take you down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, camp down there. This sign says, when mules pass, stand to the inside of the trail and follow the mule guidelines. It'll be interesting to see if we see any mules today. So just about five minutes down the Bright Angel Trail is one of the most iconic spots. It is the tunnel through the rock. I've seen this in all the guidebooks and everything that talks about the Bright Angel Trail. This is the picture, so it's cool to see this. In addition to the tunnel, it's got a little window over there on the right, too. The different signs on the trail are very interesting. Back by that land bridge, there was a sign tell you basically, don't fall down. Don't come too close to the cliff or you might fall. This sign right here tells you that it's a very strenuous hike to get down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, particularly when it's hot. And even if you think you are in peak physical shape to do the hike, you should talk to a park ranger to see because it's a 5,000 foot elevation change and many people make it down but then have a really hard time coming up. I don't think that's gonna be a problem for me today because just back there, there's an orange fence and it looks like this trail is closed shortly thereafter and I, I don't see anybody else walking to the bottom. Well, I'm gonna make it to the fence and then it'll be time to go up and find some lunch. And yes, indeed, halfway down, fence, no more down the trail. So I'm gonna work my way back up. I'm gonna shorten my hiking sticks. Why do I have these? Well, because going on these trails that are like really steep helps your knees on these. My knees aren't that great. And, now nah, I am gonna go look for some lunch. Right, with all that food, you're gonna wanna drink, and so there are good news, plenty of water filling stations around the park, but because the animals have been getting to them, like this one, they've closed this one off, and they've got this one over here. So this is at the Bright Angel Trailhead, and if you see a water filling station with a fence around it, that doesn't mean it's closed, that means they're keeping the animals out, so just go ahead and open up the gate and go in there and fill up your water bottles. Oh, and you'll also find plenty full restrooms at the major trailheads, too. So what's for lunch today? Hot dogs. Why hot dogs? I already took a bite. I was hungry. Uh, because I went into the Bright Angel Lodge, to all the restaurants and all of them, the wait was at least 45 minutes for food, except at the Fountainette, where the hot dogs were grab and go. And so, grab and go, but with an amazing view of the Grand Canyon. 18 bucks for two hot dogs, bag of chips, and a soda. Eh, not too bad, considering that's what everybody else seems to be doing. Hanging out at here, enjoying the sun, and a little bit of a hot dog or a or a sandwich. So after lunch, I hopped in my car and drove about six miles here to the Hermit's Rest, the start of the Hermit's Rest Trail. But why did I do this drive? Well, because usually you have to take a shuttle in the summer. This is the red shuttle route, and I started here at the Bright Angel Trail, and this road works its way along the rim, ultimately getting you over here. You can only drive it from December to February. The rest of the time you take the red shuttle. It's nice, there's a small parking lot here. And let's go check out Hermit's Rest. So on the way up to the Hermit's Trail is the so-called Hermit's Rest building right here. This building was built in 1914, and it is the southernmost building accessible by paved road. Uh, inside, it's a gift shop, and they sell some snacks. When I say snacks, like nothing hot, just kind of like cookies, sandwiches, that sort of stuff. All right, well, my belly is still full from hot dogs, so I didn't need to get any snacks from the Hermes Rest. As I descend down this trail, uh, very different than the Bright Angel Trail, which is all super maintained and paved. This one, much more rocky, much more narrow, but I've also got this place all to myself. I see why it's called the Hermit's Trail. 
I feel like the hermit here. Oh, and there's a sign right over here that says, getting to the bottom is optional but getting to the top is mandatory. They really want to discourage people from trying to go all the way to the bottom and the top in one day, so it seems. All right, now as I'm about 20 minutes down the trail is where I come to this like amazing view section. And they often say that the best views in the Grand Canyon, you don't find from the top, you have to hike down and see them. And I think you can get like a whole different perspective as you get further down in. This is really amazing. Oh, I just passed some hikers that came from the bottom. How could I tell they were wearing big backpacks and going really, really slowly and huffing and puffing. So I asked them, I said, hey, how long did it take you to come up? And they said, well, actually they took one day going down. They then spent one more day at the bottom and then now their third day is going up. So if you're considering a round trip, you know, that's the way to do it. A day down, camp down there for a day, recover yourself and then spend another day coming back up. Oh, and I just passed someone else who was running up this trail. Uh, that's impressive. By the way, you might notice I'm shedding, um, you know, the way kind of the desert is, is that like it's cold in the morning and it warms up in the day. It's probably 30 degrees warmer than it was this morning. And the further down you go into the canyon, the warmer and warmer it gets. So make sure you dress in layers and you can take them off as you go down. All right, I've made it about 30 minutes down the Hermit's Rest Trail. This is as good of a spot as any to turn back. I am, I am warm enough now in December when it started freezing this morning to take this off and just go t-shirt full on my way back up. You know, and they're right when they say it's harder going up than coming down. The Bright Angel Trail going back up was a piece of cake because the grade isn't very much, but this one, yeah, it's a workout. All right, so after surviving the Hermit Trail, I drove about 25 minutes to the main visitor center of the Grand Canyon, which closes at 4 p.m., interestingly enough. Uh, so I'll come back to that tomorrow. But I wanted to see Mather Point, which is a five minute walk from the visitor center. This is the number one observatory point at the Grand Canyon for people to come and see the canyon. Most of these people aren't gonna hike. They're just here to view it, get a picture, and then go on home. It feels kind of like Times Square or the Merlion in Singapore. You know, one of those like bucket list items. Uh, definitely the opposite of the Hermit's Rest Trail. Oh, the humanity, the people admiring one of these wonders of the world, the Grand Canyon. Oh, and as you can probably tell, I've got my jacket back on and by everybody's attire, it's really cold now that the sun has gone down. I, I can't feel my hands anymore. I have gloves in the car, but it's hard to hold a cell phone and use gloves, you know? Really, I feel like the temperature has dropped about 40 degrees from that time on the Hermit's Trail. I, I need to put on more clothes. All right, to thaw out after that sunset, I came to the Yavapai Tavern to get what? A burger. 23 bucks for a burger and a Pepsi. Oh, but two more bucks added me bacon jam on it. Ooh, bacon jam. After dinner, it's dark and there's really nothing to do after dark in the Grand Canyon. So I came and checked in to the El Tovar Hotel. This is the grandest hotel in the Grand Canyon, built in 1905. This room, $443 a night, a grand price to go with it. But this is why I was in the dining room. Overall, just a really neat hotel. Is the room all that more amazing than the last one at the Bright Angel? No, but it does seem more quiet, which should be good for my sleeping tonight. Though I can tell immediately that the bathroom here is actually heated. It was so cold at the Bright Angel in that bathroom. I mean, those cabins were really not well insulated, and so I'm, I think I'll be warm and toasty when I take my shower in here instead of feeling like I'm <clears throat> skinny dipping in the North Pole over the Bright Angel. All right, a good Grand Canyon morning to you. It is 7.30 in the morning. I woke up a little before seven to have breakfast at the El Tovar Hotel. Again, super good eggs Benedict today. Why I'm up this early? Well, because I wanted to see sunrise. Sunrise today is at 7.38 and it's just starting right there. There's tons of like great places to see the sunrise here at the Grand Canyon, but you know, when there's a view of the canyon, like 20 steps out from my hotel, I think, this is where I'm gonna see it, because it's easy. Sunrise time is also when they hoist the American flag out in front of the El Tovar, with the moon still up in the distance. And just a couple minutes after sunrise time, you can start to see the sun hitting the rim of the canyon right over there. The show begins. 
know, I'm not generally a huge sunrise person because I don't like to wake up all that early in the morning, but because sunrise was at 7.38 and I could just walk five steps out of my hotel, I could totally do it. It was definitely worth it. You know, this is the best free show the Grand Canyon's got to offer. Good morning, after enjoying the sunrise, I hopped on one of the Grand Canyon's free shuttles to take me over to the South Kaibab Trail. This trail will take you all the way down into the canyon. There's a suspension bridge you can cross to go across and you go up all the way to the other side. It was built in the 1920s and I'm gonna go down, not all the way, but to this place called Ua Point, which is supposed to have some really great views of the canyon since it's called Ua Point. And if I'm even more adventurous, I'll make it to Cedar Ridge, which the sign over there says that's a great hike too, but we'll see how tired I am when I get to Ua Point. All right, and after about 30 minutes down the trail, I arrived to Ua Point. How do I know? There's a sign, and there's a lot of people here. And how's the view? Say it with me now. Ooh, ah. This is also a point that a number of people like to come and enjoy sunrise. If you're gonna do that, then you need to come down with a flashlight because it'll be dark when you're getting here at sunrise. Hiking down this trail, though, uh, really reminds me of like Mount Fuji in Japan. You know, it's a trail where you're sort of like uh, bumper to bumper with people going up and down. So this is not the trail to commune with nature. This is definitely a trail to, you know, check off, check off your bucket list. It's another real question at this point is does Chris keep going or does Chris turn around? If this was a choose your own adventure video, I'd give you a button. Chris, keep going. Chris, turn around. I still have energy, but I've only been going down. And I see a bunch of people like backed up on the trail down there. So maybe I'll go down to figure out what they're stopped looking at or why they're backed up and decide after that point if I go back. So what was the backup? It was a donkey backup. The mule riders that are going down, I don't know. The mules are taking a rest. They didn't want to go, but the log jam's gone again. So I think I'll keep going. All right, so did Chris make it down to the Cedar Ridge lookout to the bathrooms? The answer is no. I've been going about another 30 more minutes. And from here, I can see just how far down it is. I can see where those bathrooms are. The donkey stopped down there for rest. And they say, you know, it's about twice as long up as it is down. So I feel like an hour down is probably good for me just in time to stop and have my rowdy rodeo trail mix that I got from the El Tovar this morning. Oh, $7. What a bargain. Wash it down with some Ito N green tea <clears throat> that I had the forethought to bring with me. Mm. A great rest point. And... It really is true that some of the best views of the Grand Canyon are from inside of it. You just don't really feel the same immense scope from up there as you do down here. So I think it's worthwhile to do this hike. Uh, I do recommend bringing hiking poles because uh, it can be steep. It can be kind of slippery. So those help to go down and go up. And now it's time to conquer the trail back up. Okay, about 40 minutes into the hike up, and the end is in sight. Well, the end is in sight. Up those final switchbacks, right up there. Whew. <sighs> and yes, if I sound out of breath, I am, but I made it back to the top in really an hour from that point to the bottom. An hour down, an hour up, probably because I was vlogging a lot and taking a lot of pictures. I think it took me longer to go down because I was really admiring the view on the way down and on my way up, just powering back up. I think because it's also winter, it wasn't as hot. Uh, but as you'll see, midday again, it's, you know, jacket's gone, beanie's gone, gloves are gone, because it's, it's really, I don't know, it's nice right now in the sun. Was it worth it? A lot of people asked me on the trail as I was going up as they were going down, and my answer is yes. I think this is the best of the three trails I did. Bright Angel, kind of weak, because you can only go down a half mile right now. The Hermit's Trail, just really steep. I liked how there was nobody there, though. That was nice. Uh, and even though this one is busy, getting down past Ua Point, then you can admire some time by yourself. All right, the trail mix only lasts so long, so I'm hungry, and I'm gonna go get lunch now. I'll see you there. And speaking of wildlife, here is three wild elk. They found a water source. You can see that's why they like the water fountains. When you see them, keep your distance, take a picture, admire them, but don't get too close. All right, a hearty lunch right here at the Maswood Food Court. Tri-tip mac and cheese, beans, 20 bucks, including a drink. Let's see how this tri-tip is. 
Tasty. Not very warm though. How are the beans? Beans are good and hot and mac and cheese. I like the sides. Mmm. I'd probably do a different option next time than the tri-tip. So after that filling but kind of mediocre lunch, uh, I decided to come back to Mather Point because when I was here yesterday, it was oh so cold and kind of dark. And so I wanted to see it in the daytime when it was warmer and I wasn't freezing. And I thought, oh, the humanity last night. Oh, the humanity today. This place is so busy, but the view is a lot better uh, here, like when it's like sunny time instead of like blue hour once the sun's gone down. After observing all that humanity at Mather Point, I went about a half mile to the Yavapai Geological Museum. This building was built in 1928. It's got some museum exhibits to tell you all about the erosion of the Grand Canyon, how it's all formed, and a really neat view out the windows. So I was gonna drive back to the El Tovar Hotel right now and chill there for a little bit, but I can't get out of the parking lot. This is the parking lot at the Geology Museum. The shuttle bus is stuck because somebody parked illegally right there. So instead, I think I'm gonna walk the rim trail. I need to walk off some of that uh, barbecue anyway. And apparently the rim trail from the Geology Museum back to the El Tovar Hotel, they call it like the Trail of Time. So it's some kind of like interpretive museum and I'll, I'll come back to my car later. Oh, and kind of nice right in front of the trail, they've got brochures. So if you want to learn about the trail as you walk, you can pick one of these up. Cool. And they call this the Million Year Trail, and they've got these markers in the ground that tell you 34 years ago, 35 years ago, 36 years ago. So I wonder whose job it was to put a million of those in the ground. It has to skip some numbers at some point. I'm, I'm gonna be checking. And this is kind of cool. They got an exhibit to help you find the Colorado River. You can look through those poles and see it, but I'll also put it on 10x zoom and you can see the Colorado River right down there. Neat. Oh, and I'm onto these floor tiles. It goes from 59 to 60 and then to 70. It skips 80, 90, 100. So that's how we get to a million. Now here at 30,000 years, they have some rocks you can touch. These are some banded spring deposits. And over here, they've got some basalt, also known as lava rock. Here we've got a river polished rock that was polished by the Colorado River deep from the bottom of the Grand Canyon. All right, well, I finished up the walk of time. I made it back to my car. The bus had left, so that was good. I uh, had to come back to the hotel to get Topher because we needed to shoot our hotel review for the El Tovar, and I can't do that without my trusty traveling panda. If you were wondering, is Topher here on this trip? He absolutely is. He wouldn't miss it for the world. Now, if you're also wondering where our OC girl and where is the Curious Princess, they are in Taiwan. They went to visit grandma and grandpa out there, and so that's why Chris is solo on this trip. They are sure to return for the next adventure, uh, and we are missing them already. All right, uh, dinner time, and then I'm gonna turn in early because tomorrow we are going to Bryce Canyon, five and a half hours of driving, so I wanna make sure we start early in the morning. Hey, stop shaking me! Okay, I don't have OC Girl's voice to voice over. It just doesn't sound right, does it? All right. All right, for dinner, I came back to the Yavapai Lodge, this time to the dining hall, and I haven't eaten it yet, but of the look and everything, I like the place of all the fast food places so far. You get one protein, a couple sides. I've got turkey, I got sweet potato, I got greens. Looks kind of healthy, right? And I got uh, some apple cobbler for dessert, and it comes with a drink for 22 bucks, so good deal. Well, all right, fellow explorers, it was now time for us to check out of the El Tovar Hotel. Who's us? Topher and I. I know I said this was a solo trip, but it's actually a duo trip, me and the traveling panda Topher. So we waved goodbye to the El Tovar Hotel, and it was time to get in the car to head on the road to Utah. But not before making one last stop into the Grand Canyon. There's a whole section I hadn't seen yet, which is the section down Desert View Road. This leads out to the east entrance, which made the most sense for me heading out to Utah. Uh, and the big attraction down there is the 
Watchtower. This watchtower is a seven-story stone watchtower built in 1932. And just to give you some appreciation of scale for how big the Grand Canyon National Park is, this is 26 miles away from the El Tovar Hotel, about a 40-minute drive, all still within the National Park, but really neat views up there. I'm glad I was able to check this out, particularly because it was on the way and I didn't have to drive out of my way to go see it. But with that, Topher and I waved goodbye to the Grand Canyon. We'll miss you until next time. And now we were on the road to Utah. All right, so I'm just leaving the Grand Canyon National Park and tuning the radio to some local stations. I always love to listen to the radio in various places, whether it's country music or whatever is local to the region. And you know what's local to this region? Native American music, 88.1 FM. Super cool. Part about an hour outside of the Grand Canyon on the drive. Uh, this area kind of feels like I'm driving through the Grand Canyon. These big red rock walls, the sun, U.S. Arizona Highway 89. The other interesting observation about driving around here, lots of Native American stands on the side of the road. So if you were looking to pick up some Native American merch or art, you'll have lots of opportunities on the drive just on the stands on the side of the highway. All right, my first stop on this section of the road trip is at mile marker 527 on US Highway 89. I'm a sucker for viewpoints, and this is a really amazing one. This expansive canyon is really impressive. You can see those big red rock walls over there. This one, definitely worth a stop to. Oh, and by the way, if my nose looks shiny, I have Vaseline on him in my lips. It's just, it's so dry here. Oh, and if you didn't get to pick up uh, any Native American souvenirs from the other vendors, there's some vendors up here and at many of the scenic rest stops along the way. Okay, time to get back in the car. It's cold out here and I'm hungry. Next stop, chicken in Page, Arizona. Oh, and the drive right after that viewpoint, really quite impressive. It's blasted in between these two rocks up here. I mean, this if you like scenic drives, this is a good one. It is twisty and turny through this section and, uh, and no cell phone service, but that's okay, because it's worth the view. Oh, there's a viewpoint on this side too. I, I, think I'm, I think I'm good with my first one. I mean, it's really interesting on this drive how quickly the terrain varies from those red rocks just two minutes later, now this little plain and prairie up at the top. This is at an elevation of 6,000 feet, so a little lower than the Grand Canyon South Rim, which was 7,000 feet, and that area before uh, where I said we were driving next to the Grand Canyon, that was an elevation of about 5,000 feet. Oh, and did I say chicken for lunch earlier? I meant barbecue. Actually, I went to the chicken place. There was no place to park, so I drove around and found Big John's. I found the smoke coming out of the smokers and knew that my tri-tip meal from the other day had to be redeemed, and it was, this place was delicious. I got the chopped brisket sandwich. The meat comes unsauced. They give you three different sauces that you can put on it. Really good, smoky flavor, and you know this place is legit because I, I think it used to be a gas station. Any barbecue restaurant in a gas station immediately gets one more tofer. All right, well now that my belly is full with all of that barbecue, another way you know that barbecue is really good is when you smell like smoke afterwards. And I do, my car smells like smoke now. All right, super delicious. I would definitely go back there again. Now I'm back on uh, US 89. I just crossed over the Colorado River. There's a dam there that dams up the river. You can actually take tours of the dam. I didn't because I want to get to uh, Bryce Canyon before it gets dark today. There are two other attractions worth checking out in Page if you have a long stop there. One is the Horseshoe Bend. It's a bend in the Colorado River where it makes a U-shape. You can hike up to it and see that. Uh, and then number two is Antelope Canyon. It's this little slot canyon that you can uh, walk through. But you gotta like time it at the right time to make sure you get there when there's actually some daylight and you get the best pictures. Uh, but now, onwards to Utah. And here we are, just about 10 minutes out of page. Welcome to Utah. Welcome Life to Utah. elevated. Oh, thank you, Google Maps. It says, welcome to Utah, in case I missed the sign. Oh, and another note on the landscape, entering Utah, definitely much more 
brown or tan, right? Arizona is very red, but Utah has this much more tannish, brownish color. And it's like, it's immediate crossing the border as if somebody like took out a box of crayons and said, Arizona, you get the red ones, Utah, you get the brown ones. And the next scenic landmark in Utah is the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. So there's a number of hiking trails here as well to look at beautiful rock formations. That's what a lot of Utah is, like amazing rocks and geology in the state. Such as brown, but still amazing. You know, doing a drive like this really makes you appreciate how big the United States of America is. I mean, I'm in Southern California, so I spend most of my time on freeways and traffic around urban sprawl, but you know, here for like hundreds of miles, there's like nothing except nature. It's, uh, you know, you go, to, you go to other countries in Europe and it's like, it's pretty developed even if it's farmland or something like that, but this, this is just natural, the state it's been, you know, since the beginning of the planet, or the time the dinosaurs roamed, maybe. All right, we have civilization on the horizon again. You know, I feel like uh, people back in the old days when they would navigate by ship and they're like, land ho! This is the town of Kanab, Utah, with a gigantic American flag right there. There's home to the Grand Staircase Escalante Visitor Center here. And in just a half mile is where I'm gonna turn right onto Route 100 to go the final 90 minutes into Bryce Canyon. You know, these little towns, <clears throat> always funny the names of things. Crazy Horse Resort, Traveler's Motel, you know, these are definitely the kind of places where people aren't like booking them ahead of time. They're the kind of places like Travel Lodge on the left that says, uh, I'm tired of driving, it's dark, In and I just mile, need to turn sleep. Right on a south 100 east. All right, Google Maps, I will turn right in a quarter mile. Sometimes because gas prices are interesting, the gas price here at the Chevron, $3.41 a gallon. And we see a sign up here that says Zion National Park, 30 miles, Bryce Canyon, 77 miles. Right here at Mount Carmel Junction, two gas stations. I think I'm gonna stop into the shell. They had a billboard before with a sign that said, large clean restroom, so let's give it a go. But first, I need to get some gas. Now, because there's a sign here that says, international cards must pay inside, I thought I'd make a note for my international visitors on how you get gas here in the USA. You prepay for gas, you always pay beforehand. If your credit card works here at the pump, you can just pay here, though there is a sign that says international cards pay inside. If your card does work here, uh, then after your card works, you push one of those numbers on which gas you want, for most rental cars, it'll be the regular. If you're driving like a sports car, then it'll be the premium. And if it doesn't work out here, then you would go inside. When you use your credit card inside, you usually need to tell them like how much gas you want, or if you're paying with cash, same thing. And uh, then they'll authorize your card for that amount. And then when you're done, just put it back in like you would Oh, and this is interesting. The Mini Mart, not an AM, PM, or 7-Eleven, White Mountain Trading Post with a Native American inside. What's it look like inside? Ooh, we've got beef jerky, we've got bandanas, we've got fur on the ceiling. This is a this is a very interesting gas station. All right, back on the road again, 60 miles to Bryce Canyon, and the verdict is the restrooms were nice and clean. So if you're looking for a pit stop on the way, that shell with the Native American Mini Mart, good spot. All right, just about 10 minutes past that gas station. Oh, this hillside up there, there's a whole bunch of numbers up on top of it, and I, I, don't, I don't know why, but it's the first time I've seen a mountain like that with a whole bunch of numbers on the side. Uh-oh, this traffic backup doesn't look good. Google Maps says there's a crash ahead and a five minute delay, but I feel like this looks like it's gonna be more than five minutes. It's at this point I'm really glad I made that restroom stop. One of my road trip rules is use the restroom and get gas before you know you need it. You know, the best way you don't have to have an emergency is if you never have an emergency and related to gas. I always generally get gas at a half tank. That's the way you never run out of gas. If you always fill up at a half tank, you're always gonna have gas. All right, well, I've been sitting here about 15 minutes now. Um, no movement of the traffic. Uh, somebody says he saw the tow truck go by and they said it's a one car accident, so 
Hopefully we'll get moving again soon. This is in the little t small town of Glendale, and uh, I don't know if you can hear the roosters or the chickens in the background, but this is a town where just kind of like chickens roam around. And I'm sure all the people that live here now are like, what on earth is the deal with all these cars in our town? This is, this is the challenge of these kind of like two lane highways through the mountains when there's a wreck everything just gets backed up. All right, and after about an hour of sitting there, we're finally on the road again. It gave me some time in Google Docs to write some of my scripts for what I'm gonna say in Bryce Canyon. I thought about putting up my drone to check out the traffic and figure out where the backup was, but I figured my time was more useful writing my scripts. So this thing about road trips, you gotta be, gotta be flexible. It's good to build in some extra time. You never know what's gonna happen. Oh, uh, it looks like I found the scene of the incident here, and it appears they're only letting cars go by in one lane. They've stopped the trucks entirely, because uh, the trucks can't go by. And uh, there is definitely the tow truck in the middle of the road, and oh yeah, it's a, it's a big, big semi-truck that's over there, like rolled off on the side of the road. I can see why we weren't moving for a long time. Yeah, actually the trailer had entirely flipped over and they're diverting cars on the shoulder off the pavement to get by. So that makes a lot of sense why nobody was moving. I didn't actually record the thing because police were directing traffic and I wanted to be a, a safe driver. And here you can see traffic backed up in the other direction because they're just letting one lane pass that truck at a time. All right, 20 minutes to go. We are at the final turn off to Bryce Canyon, right turn on 12 East. And you definitely know you're getting to a touristy place now because there's billboards that talk about Bryce Canyon. There's a big gift shop on the right hand side. And it seems like they're not, they don't call them gift shops around here. Everything's a, everything's a trading post. There are some rustic cabins on the right. Many of these hotels I've passed uh, just say like, open for the season. One of them was like, we reopen in May. So uh, I think I'm the only person dumb enough to come to Bryce Canyon in uh, in the dead of winter. A little further down Route 12, the rocks, they're red again. Looks like Utah does have some red crayons in their crayon box. And wow, like these rocks on the side of the road, particularly these that I'm coming up on, they totally look fake. They look like a fake wall that was built here just for you to drive through, but they're totally not. Like those are, those are actual rocks here in Red Canyon with the extra red crayons. As we climb up the elevation in this road, the greenery changes. We get those kind of pine trees that we saw like at the Grand Canyon and there is snow on the hills in the shady spots. And I think it's been a while since they've had snow here. And so this is just a lot of snow that doesn't actually melt. Uh, look, even more snow up on these hills. I'm glad I've got warm weather clothes with me. Oh, and this is cool. Look at this. The road goes through a natural tunnel right here. This is neat. Whee! That's, this isn't the only tunnel. There's a second tunnel right here. Oh, by the way, if these uh, red rocks look familiar at all, uh, Big Thunder Mountain Railroad at Disneyland was actually built uh, after Bryce Canyon, like modeled on the rocks and things like that here. So I think that's, I think it's pretty cool as someone who's ridden Big Thunder Mountain Railroad a gazillion times, it's kind of neat to, to see the place that it was inspired from. And now we're at the top of that road at this plateau. There was just a sign that said summit elevation, 7,777 feet. Must be good luck. If there was a slot machine, I would play here right now. All right, and now we're entering the town of Bryce City. This is basically a little touristy town built up to uh, support lodging and restaurants out in front of the gate. Probably the most famous hotel is the Ruby's Inn here on the right. I'm staying at the Best Western across the way that I'll show you in just a little bit, but you can book like horseback rides and ATVs. Ruby's Inn has a buffet and a steak room, so uh, I think this is where I'm getting dinner in a little bit. On the right is the Bryce Canyon National Park sign. Getting close. And here we are, the entrance gate to Bryce Canyon. And you know what? Nobody's here, so nobody is at the feet gate. I'll pay tomorrow morning when I come back.
Well, since it's almost five o'clock once I got into the park, uh, it's not enough daylight to do a hike. I think what I'm gonna do is just drive the scenic drive. There's this like one road that goes to the park. So I'm just gonna take this all the way to the end, be a completist today, get my bearings and orientation on this place, and then come back tomorrow morning to get down and see the hoodoos in person. Oh, but yeah, this road, uh, definitely, definitely snowy around here. You know, the, the deeper I get into Bryce Canyon, the snowier and snowier it gets. Luckily, the road itself is quite plowed and clear. All right, I did stop my car, I didn't make it all the way in, because I found a viewpoint to look out at. This is the Sheep Creek and Swamp Canyon Overlook, and we see some of the hoodoos. These are these interesting rock formations. This isn't the main one, but, oh, it's cold. Yeah, it's 32 degrees right now. It's gonna get colder and colder tonight. That's a beautiful view. Would it be better if I wasn't in it? Here's the view without me. The next observatory is Far View Point, and yes, apparently I do have this whole place to myself. Oh, there's one other person. They're gonna spoil it for me. I am not the only dumb person who comes to Bryce Canyon in the winter. All right, let's check out the view from here. Just a few minutes up the road is the Natural Bridge Lookout, and I'm sure this one is usually really busy in season, but today I'm the only one here to see this natural bridge. Kind of like those things I drove through earlier, those tunnels, except I think those are man-made and this one's real. That's pretty cool. And yes, doesn't the top of this look like Big Thunder Mountain Railroad? Couldn't you see like a, a roller coaster going right through that tunnel? I can. All right, let's go to the next viewpoint. Now back in the car, one would assume that the Bryce Canyon scenic road that runs through the national park is like in a canyon, right? Like you would assume that, but actually it turns out this road is on like top of a ridge. I guess much like the Grand Canyon where the road is on the rim and then all the attractions are down below. Bryce Canyon, it's kind of a weird name for this national park because it's, it's not, turns out it's not a canyon at all. It's a series of amphitheaters that are carved into the plateau on the side of this hill, which is why all the lookouts are kind of on that side, because that's where all the interesting stuff. Next observatory, Agua Canyon, elevation 8,800 feet. This would be lucky in Chinese numbers. Eight is a lucky number, four is an unlucky number. And what do we see down here? Yes, we see more of those red rock spires. We see the sunset, we see the red off in the distance. We see the snow on the red rocks. It is really a magical view and I would stay longer except I am racing against the clock to get to the last viewpoint at the end of this road before I lose all light. So let's go back in the Ultima. Oh, and when I say this road is like on the rim of a canyon, it's really more of a ridge line. So when you're here at sunset, there's like beautiful sunsets on both sides. I just passed Ponderosa Point. I'm gonna skip that one in the interest of actually making it to the end. All right, I made it to the end of the road. Still some daylight. This is Rainbow Point. Elevation 9,115 feet. That's about 2,700 meters. This is the highest point in the park. There's a neat lookout over there. Now then let's check out the view underneath that building. This looks like it used to be like an info booth or something, but now it's just uh, kind of a kind of a seating area. Ooh, it looks icy here. So let me hold on to the handrail so we can get out to the edge. Chris, Chris really doesn't want to slip on this ice today. It will make my hikes difficult tomorrow. But from here, you can look out on the whole plateau that the hoodoos are carved into and the amphitheaters and really quite an amazing view out here. Like even, even further distance than the Grand Canyon. From here, it just seems like you can see forever and ever. And all right, as day turns into twilight, I'm gonna hop back in the Altima, make my way back down the canyon while there's still a little light on the road. Good news is there's only one way, so I don't think I can get too lost on that way down. But don't put any bets on that. Okay, I stopped at one last viewpoint on my way down. This is Black Birch Canyon, and it looks back uh, on Rainbow Point right there. But what I was just thinking, and actually the one other person at this viewpoint said to me was, it's so quiet. And I thought the same thing to myself. It's so quiet. Like, it's so quiet. You literally hear nothing here. I mean, you hear me talking, but when I'm not talking, it's literally silence. 
right, all that viewpointing's got me hungry for dinner. There's not really much to eat in Rice City, particularly in the winter, so I am at the Ruby's Inn Buffet. 25 ish dollars. Get a full buffet. What have I got here? I've got some pork chops, some salmon, some pot roast, some mashed potatoes, some mac and cheese, some corn, and some soup. Yeah, definitely not like a Caesar's Palace buffet. Definitely more like a hometown buffet, but uh, you know, the price was right, the weight was short, and uh, I can choose whatever I want. And I even saved a little room for dessert. One man can never have too much ice cream and pink cake. So after dinner, I went to explore the Ruby's General Store. This is quite a place. They got food, they got a gift shop, they got camping supplies. They even have their own newspaper about like activities you can take here. And you can even get a horse saddle down here for $2,000. Maybe next time. They've even got a little tiny post office inside. And they've got some historic photos up here showing that the first Ruby's Inn was built in 1922. Now that my belly's full of time to check into the hotel, not the Ruby's Inn, but the Best Western across the street, the world famous Best Western Bryce Canyon Plus Grand Hotel. I'm just kidding, it's it's not world famous, I, but I'm definitely staying here now. Let's go check out the room. Oh, interesting lodge feel to it. This is probably the nicest Best Western I think I've entered just from first appearance. Neat rocking chairs here. Uh, right, and into the elevator, up to the fourth floor we go. All right, and now we're looking for room 3444, and it is right here in front of the elevators. I asked for a quiet room, and it's amazing that they consider a quiet room to be right in front of the elevator. I'm only going to be here for one night, so... You know, it's annoying when they put two keys in this, and two keys won't open, so then you have to, like, take out one key. Can somebody please invent the room key or lock that will open with two keys stacked on top of each other? That would be nice. Light switch. Oh, the room is dark. Yeah, one of these rooms that only has lamp, lamp lights. So let me turn on the lights and I'll show you around. Okay, now with lights on, my first impressions, the room is big, but it's entirely mediocre. The lobby was really nice, but the room is really kind of forgettable. I mean, this is everything I think a Best Western room would be. I should say it is clean, so that's good. It does have a mini fridge and a microwave and lots of room, but it really doesn't have much soul. I'd describe it as soulless. It is nice that they have lotion because it is very dry here. Toilet, bathtub, there we go. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that this is the cheapest hotel room night on the whole trip. $150 a night includes free breakfast, so I guess I get what I pay for. All right, and speaking of free breakfast, here it is up before sunrise. I've got some French toast, a waffle, some eggs, a fruit bowl right here, and yogurt that comes out of a machine. I've never had yogurt that comes out of a machine before. Something new today at the Best Western plus Bryce Canyon Grand. All right, as the sun just starts to come up right there, it's time to say goodbye to the Best Western and hello to my very frosty car. It is so cold this morning, and I thought my car had a lot of frost in the Grand Canyon, but this is like a deep freeze last night. Well, while waiting for my car to defrost, it gave me some time to put the spikes on my shoes to go hike in Bryce Canyon. Mental note, this probably would have been better to do in the hotel when my room was warm instead of out here when my hands are freezing, but that's okay. They're on. By the way, these are size 14 Nike boots, in case you're wondering. All right, and my first stop on this chilly 19 degree morning is gonna be the visitor center here to get myself oriented to the park. And since they were closed yesterday when I got here, I couldn't check it out before. Well, the visitor center was pretty cool. I mean, I actually like the visitor center here at Bryce Canyon better than the one at Grand Canyon. Like Grand Canyon really had nothing in the visitor center, but Bryce Canyon has like neat displays and a museum and it tells you about the hoodoo, so that's pretty neat. I'm gonna start on the, uh, most popular trail in the park, which is called the Queens Trail Navajo Loop Trail. It's actually two trails that go together uh, and it starts at Sunset Point. So 
I'm gonna get to the parking and to the walking. And by the way, this main road that I'm driving on, much nicer in the morning when the sun's out rather than at like blue hour once the sun's gone down. So before starting my hike and putting on my boots with the spikes, I checked out the views here a little bit. The view at Sunset Point, really quite amazing. Definitely better than all of those views that I checked out yesterday. I mean, Rainbow Point was pretty cool to see all the way back to the park. And so was that natural bridge one. But this one, you get really great views of the hoodoos and the features and the hiking trails down below. So this is a solid view. This makes it all worth it, really. Okay, boots, spikes, extra pair of socks. My Hoka Bondi eights there can go off. My hiking practice when I go for like serious hikes is to double sock it. So I have my smart wool socks right under here and then I have some thick wigwam hiking socks that I put over those and then I put the boots on. I find the two socks helps prevent blisters. I don't like blisters. You get a blister on day one and then the rest of the trip is just, just ruined. All right, all spiked up, ready to go. These are the micro spikes by Catula. In case you're wondering, I got them from REI. All right, so I made it to Sunrise Point, which is gonna be the beginning of the hike down there to the Queen's Garden Trail. The view here is equally rewarding, but what's interesting to see from up here is on this side how snowy it is, but how on this side right over here, there's no snow, all in the span of the same park. So my immediate impression, just being about 10 minutes on this trail, is that it is already cooler than any of the three major hikes I did at the Grand Canyon. Why? Well, other than looking out into the canyon, the hikes on the Grand Canyon don't have that much scenery, and they are pretty, like, strenuous hikes. We're here, like, immediately you get down to see these beautiful views, uh, and I am also really appreciating the spikes on my feet because this trail really is quite slippery. I've seen some people slipping and sliding on it. Uh, and the sign at the top said this trail, the Queen's Garden Trail, is the least difficult into the amphitheater, though many still find it to be quite challenging. And these spikes that are on my feet, you know, I originally ordered a set from Amazon and they came and they were the wrong size and they didn't fit. And I didn't try them until the day before and so I didn't have time to order any new ones. And so I went to REI and I brought my boots and I sized them up and I am so glad I spent the like $80 for these spikes on my feet <clears throat> because I've never felt so stable going down a hike as today having these on. Although these spikes are definitely noisy, I won't be able to sneak up on anybody, so I apologize for the crunching, but that's what's gonna keep Chris uh, in hiking condition so he can hike Zion tomorrow, too. Okay, just after the intersection with the horse trail, there's a little backup, traffic backup on the trail. It's not donkeys from the Grand Canyon. It's to go through a little tunnel, kind of like the ones we drove through earlier, except this is a pedestrian tunnel. And of course, the traffic backup is because everybody wants to take a selfie. All right, let's go through this tunnel right here. And as I said, yes, less than six feet tall, so I gotta duck down to get through here. Pretty cool. So that traffic backup on the tunnel really made me realize that I am not the only person that comes here in December. There's actually quite a few people here, uh, but most people don't come in December. Most people come between uh, June, July, August. They get most of their visitors in the summer because it turns out most of the stuff out in town closed in the winter. But uh, I think there's a really great time to come because if this isn't busy, I'd, I'd hate to see busy. I also like that it's much less busy than the Grand Canyon, which was crazy on those trails. Just a few minutes after that first tunnel, there's a second tunnel on the trail. This one, not as much of a backup because I guess everybody's got their selfies. This one's a little taller, so I don't think I have to, I don't think I have to duck going through this tunnel. All right, cool. And I know I mentioned this yesterday about how uh, the Big Thunder Mountain Railroad at Disneyland was inspired by this place, but this spot right here on this trail really is reminiscent of Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. And now that it's 11 a.m., it's really starting to warm up quite nicely. I almost wish there were some lockers or a coat hang or something I could leave my jacket on. But a nice part of this trail is it's not, like it's not too steep. It's steep at the beginning to go down, but then the rest of it, once you get down, kind of just like meanders around the canyon. And every like different meander, just like this one right here, is a different viewpoint that you get to see the hoodoos from a different perspective. Oh, and if you're playing a drinking game along with this video, drink every time I say hoodoo. It's just such a fun word. 
because it rhymes with voodoo. Oh, here's a third tunnel on the trail we're going through. This one's about 10 feet tall, so Sasquatch could fit through there. All right, and now we're at the major intersection. Let's see, here we can go to Queen Victoria, which we're definitely gonna see, and Sunset Point. Okay, let's go find Queen Victoria. And here we are with the Queen Victoria hoodoo. Queen, so great to meet you. And I'm so glad there was a sign over there to tell me that you were the Queen Victoria hoodoo because unless I like squinted with on one eye, if I kept the other eye open, I, I don't know that I could tell. It's supposed to resemble a statue of Queen Victoria in London when they named it. But you know, as these things erode, their shape changes. And so maybe that looked more like Queen Victoria back in the day. Oh, there's also kind of a neat thing which is uh, on these different signs along the hike, they have these little medallions. And if you take selfies with three of them and show them at the visitor center, they will give you a special sticker to say you've hiked Bryce Canyon and one of the medallions is on this sign. After Queen Victoria, there's a neat little slot canyon on the way to Sunset Point. Let me turn the camera around so you can see going through the canyon. All right, here we go. It's pretty narrow. It's about as just a little wider than my shoulders. Short little canyon, but it's also just like, you know, I've talked about the snow being icy, but I feel like the white along with the red really makes an interesting kind of like special color contrast. And it's nice that it's not all that hot down here. Cause in the summer, I bet this place gets really, really warm. Oh, and there's a lot of big pine trees here, you know, kind of like at the Grand Canyon South Rim. All right, I'm in quite a narrow part of the canyon right now where it seems like it gets very little sun. It's like 11 o'clock and still shaded here. Lots of snow in this section, but I found under this rock ledge, there's this log. And under this log, uh, there's quite an echo. Echo, echo, echo. Echo. Mm -hmm. Now the second part of the Queen's Garden Trail after the Queen Victoria hoodoo, kind of boring a little bit. No hoodoos down here, just trees and snow, but I think we're getting around to sort of the second amphitheater for the trail to go up that looks like it will have more. I know it'll have more because I saw it from the top. Also note about hiking it, 8,000 feet elevation. For us city slickers that come from the beach, you know, there's definitely like more strain and more huff and puff than hiking up here. But this is how I can eat so much. I would say I'm looking forward to lunch, but not really. Like, I'll have to eat lunch, but the food options here in Bryce City are, uh... Yeah, the buffet last night was okay. It was okay. I think for lunch I'll try the fast food burger place. I expect it to just be sustenance as opposed to deliciousness. All right, I finished the Queen's Garden Trail. It is now noon, and I have a decision to make. Do I keep going onto the Peekaboo Loop, or do I go back up to the car? Now, the choose-your-own-adventure part, keep going. Go back to the car. Keep going. Go back to the car. I'm gonna go back to the car. Uh, I don't think I can do another two hours with all of my garb here. It's actually kind of hot down here now. So I think back to the car and then I need to finish, I need to finish my guide video. I need to go find the lodge and shoot some of those scenes and then lunch and then uh, on to Zion. So let's head up the hill. All right, just like at the Grand Canyon, going up the hill, jacket off. For a 19 degree morning, it's in the high 40s now, and in the sun, actually quite warm and pleasant. But it's not like this all winter, but you know, early December, typically they don't get their big snows yet, so if you are planning a winter trip, you know, I think early December is a good one. And on the way up, there's a little turnoff for two bridges. Here you can see one, two little natural bridges that connect to the slot canyon. Continuing my way up the Navajo Trail, very different from the Queen's Garden Trail. Queen's Garden Trail, very open. You see lots of vistas. This trail, very closed in. It's in like a slot canyon. So instead of seeing the hoodoos at the distance, drink if you're doing the drinking game, uh, you see the hoodoos from down below. And this kind of a neat view just to appreciate how tall and big these things are and how small I feel right now. All right, now that I'm almost to the top of this trail, how long did it take me? Two and a half hours, but I also stopped to get some video and take some pictures, probably more than most. Now the question is, was it worth it to come to Bryce Canyon? And my answer is definitely so. This is an amazing 
trail. This is an amazing amphitheater. These hoodoos are amazing. And so I would definitely do this again. Uh, and definitely as I started earlier, I said the hikes. Yes, I like the hike here better than the hike in the Grand Canyon. The hike in the Grand Canyon I've just feels like kind of like grueling is the word to describe the hike there. But the hike here is just really kind of like magical and peaceful, even though there are people and it's busy. Uh, it's not like back to back like in the Grand Canyon. So Bryce Canyon, you'll definitely be on my list to come back to again. All right, I'm here at the Canyon Diner for the cheeseburger. Cheeseburger, bag of fries, drink, $12. This place gets two stars on Yelp. Impressive, what's inside? Little lettuce, little tomato, little pickle. Not many other options for quick eats around here. Let's see how this two star burger is. All right, so how's the burger? How's the two star burger? Two stars? Not better than that. I'm gonna give it a solid two and a half. All right, well now that my tummy is full, back on the road again to Zion. Two hours, uh, total drive time to there. Should get me there just in time for the 4 p.m. check-in at the lodge within the park itself. So the drive is the same as before, just in the other way. Going down the hill through those two tunnels in the rocks, which are still as cool as they were going up, along Highway 89. And then the turnoff to Zion National Park is that gas station that I was in yesterday that had the native American Mini Mart. And then 12 miles down this road begins Zion National Park. And then there's a sign about a tunnel that's 18 miles ahead that I'll show you when we get there. And here we are at the entrance gate, 3 p.m. This one is staffed today. All right, I paid my $35 admission. And then just right over here, I stopped at the first viewpoint for Checkerboard Mesa. That's a hill that Looks like a checkerboard. This is just right after the visitor center. And by the way, my face looks really red. Just so you know, it's not this red. This is like, I don't know, the phone makes my face extra red when I'm pointing into the sun. I'm, I have, Chris has not turned into a lobster yet. Of course, that checkerboard Mesa, you drive by it too, but the viewpoint is there just so you can stop and admire for longer. And wow, this is definitely a really cool drive. It goes so close to these tall rocks. Also find it interesting that the road here is red. Okay, Utah. You really wanted to get back at me when I said there wasn't enough red in Utah, right? They got a lot of red for the red, red crayons for their red road. Okay, this is the first tunnel. This is not the tunnel I'm talking about, but this is just a tunnel to get you through things. The next tunnel is really the one I'm talking about. Chris, what are you talking about this tunnel? You'll see, you'll see. Okay, so this is the tunnel I was talking about. This tunnel is nearly a mile long, and what's important about this tunnel is if you have a really big vehicle, you need a special permit to drive through this tunnel because it's not very tall. And if you have a really big vehicle, you need to drive in the center of the road, which means they need to stop all of the traffic. So if you're driving a big RV or something like that, uh, check that out before you go this way. Okay, and here we are at the other end, emerging from the tunnel where you can see the main Zion Canyon. And uh, it's like a couple minutes in that tunnel. It is pretty, pretty long. But the view from here is quite amazing. All right, so here's the part where we become special because uh, I'm staying at the lodge. There's this gate that typically only allows in shuttles and there's this gate access code and they gave me a special code which opens the gate. That's one of like the perks of staying at the lodge is that when you're at the lodge, you can drive your car in when it's only shuttles allowed. So. You can't drive your car everywhere, but you can drive it in as far as the lodge. And from that gate, it's another two and a half miles down this very, very scenic road to the lodge. Now, after about six minutes down that road, we reach the entrance to the lodge. Sign up here that says registration up this way. And then as you see, it says road closed up there. This is as far as personal vehicles can go to the lodge when shuttles are operating. So let's go and check in. And so like a lot of these national park lodges, the check-in is in one building and then the rooms are in different buildings over there. And here we go, heading into the lodge in the lobby. A nice, woody, rocky atmosphere. Short line to check in. 
No fireplace, though. All right, got my room key all checked in. Sort of funny at the front desk, they have a number of signs to tell you that cell phone service is non-existent here, which they're right, and that the Wi-Fi service is really spotty. Um, they said if I want to eat dinner, I should make a reservation now because the restaurant's open for dinner. It's upstairs. I think I'll probably go out into town tonight. Uh, and there's a gift shop here too. All right, I need to go move my car into the big lot and we'll go check out the room. But my initial impressions of just being here right now, it's kind of cool staying at the lodge. Uh, last time we were here, we stayed at the Spring Hill Suites out in town. And what's neat is that since there's no more shuttles coming into the canyon, everybody's leaving. It's like, this place is super peaceful. It's also cool, there's like this big grassy area in front of the lodge. Like, there's some kids out there playing ball. Just seems like a good down home. American spot. Because the hotel is like a few different buildings and also a few little cottages that are out here in front. I am in the Watchman building. Looks like up on the second floor. And here we are, room 221. Let's open this up and check it out. There we have a big king bed, a little bench here at the bottom. This room has a real woody and rustic vibe to it. Even the trash can is in like a wood container. Interesting um, stained glass lamps everywhere. Desk right here, big thing for a television. Uh, a couple of seating chairs on either side. There's a cool balcony out here. My room uh, looks, I'm gonna call it at the, at the back side of Zion, or like at the mountain right in behind. That probably means this room's gonna be quiet back here, but I think all of these rooms in the two-story buildings have balconies. Oh, and they've got like rocking chairs out here. There's two rocking chairs and there's a little table, so. That's pretty neat. And then back inside, what don't we have? There's no refrigerator in the room, uh, but in here we have the bathroom. Also kind of have that wood thing under the sink. Uh, this is the closet. There's, oh, you know what? Maybe there is a little mini fridge. Actually, there is a little mini fridge down here along with the coffee machine, ironing board, hair dryer, extra toilet paper, and then the Toilet part of the bathroom, kind of dim in here. Um, and the bathtub with uh, one fixed head right up there. Oh, and I forgot to tell you how much I paid for this room. $248 a night, which uh, really compared to the El Tovar is a much nicer, bigger room that even has a balcony. So I think that's a pretty good value. And oh wow, it's not nighttime yet, but I was just heading to my car. And what do I see? But a deer in the parking lot. Hey, Mr. Deer. All right, so I made it into town. I just had dinner right here at Mimi's Cafe with a EE -E, Mimi's and had their Hawaiian sandwich, pulled pork pineapple, super delicious. I would definitely do that again. Uh, 20 bucks for the sandwich plus a drink, which is a reasonable price for this little touristy town in Zion. All right, so after dinner, I came back to the lodge and now I'm sitting in one of these fabulous rocking chairs in front of the lobby. And so what's it like here at night as I sit under these yellow lights? Why yellow lights? Well, because they don't want to have any light pollution to see the stars at night. This is a dark sky park and really looking up, it is a amazing starry night up there. My camera simply can't capture it, but the sky is a bright with all the twinkles. Other than that though, it is, it is like really dark, like super, super dark. And, uh, you know, everybody's walking around with their like cell phone light on. And I noticed in the gift shop that I went into closes at eight, they sell uh, headlamps and they sell flashlights. No doubt, because people get here, they're like, I can't, I can't find my room. It's so dark. It's, it's really dark, but also really peaceful. You know, this is my first time in Zion without, without people, really. Like there's no shuttles, there's no people milling about. I mean, obviously there's a few people staying here at the hotel, but like the general like quietness and calmness is um, it's quite nice. All right, a good Zion Canyon morning to you out here in front of the lodge. I just finished breakfast up in the restaurant. 12 bucks, all you can eat, pretty solid. Pancakes, eggs, fresh fruit. Uh, and it's definitely funny because these lodges are all operated by the same company, Zantera. I'm like, the bacon and the sausage taste pretty similar to what I had at the Grand Canyon at the El Tovar just for half the price and a buffet. So that's pretty solid. Actually, I think of the lodges and you know accommodations I've stayed at on this trip so far, this one's my favorite, Price is Right. 
night. $250 a night, breakfast buffet, I like it. And they just put up the uh, American flag out there in front. Though you can see it's blowing quite a bit, which means it's, it's windy and my, my hands are a little bit cold. So uh, it's time for me to uh, check out of this hotel and uh, go explore Zion. Let's go check it out. All right, checked out of the hotel, luggage in the car. Now I am on the Grotto Trail. This is a half mile trail from the lodge to Angel's Landing, which is the most popular hike in the park, which you have to have a permit for to hike, which I don't, because uh, I didn't win the lottery. I tried yesterday. They have a daily lottery and they have a seasonal lottery. And I didn't plan this trip early enough to do the seasonal lottery and I didn't win the daily lottery. I still had to pay $6 to enter the lottery, but I'm gonna go up as far as I can to the top, which could be about two and a half miles, or could be less if I get tired. Ooh, there's some deer down there. Let's take a look. Yeah, there's a neat part about being here so early is there's much more wildlife since there's no people. Hey there, deer. Now, if you don't have a permit, it's still a worthwhile hike. From the grotto, you can hike all the way up the West Rim Trail, up Walter's Wiggle to the Scout Lookout, and what you just can't do is the last half mile, which goes up the chains. All right, so about 15 minutes into my walk, I've made it to Shuttle Stop 6, the grotto. From here, I'm gonna turn the camera around, and you can see Angel's Landing right up there, a nice little bridge to cross over the Virgin River, and you know, maybe in an hour or two, I'll be up at the lookout. And uh, as I crossed the bridge over this river today, and as we saw in that flag earlier, it is windy. This is definitely like, it's actually colder here today than in Bryce Canyon, even though the temperature's warmer. There's no ice because of the, because the wind. Here's a friendly sign letting me know I need a permit to get to the top. Thank you, thank you. And the other sign that says it's two miles to the lookout. And as we leave the river and start to go uphill, the trail is actually paved. So many people that hike this trail, they've decided to make it really, really permanent. And about 20 minutes into the trail, it gets you to the viewpoint where you can see the part that's carved up the hill. See right here, it goes this way, this way, this way, right into the rock face, up to the top. That's something. Oh boy, and after about 20 minutes on this trail, now that I'm in the wiggles, the, uh, the switchbacks up here, uh, jacket off, beanie off, gloves off, whew. It's getting pretty warm. It's another one, I wish I wish there was a coat check right here and I could pick it up back on my way down again. You know, and I also find that whatever time they list on a guidebook about hikes, I need to add about 30% since I keep stopping and taking videos, take two and take three and take photos. So hopefully I'll finish this hike by nightfall. It's 10 a.m. so I have a few hours left. And now this is that cool part where the trail is actually like carved into the hillside. Boy, and if I sound out of breath, I'm not even trying to cover it up. I'm out of breath. This is one steep hike. Now after those switchbacks, it crosses a little bridge and then goes back in this way. All right, so after a little flat scene there through the slot canyon, which is really cool, now we begin the steep rise. This is Walter's Wiggles. And this is where it gets really, really steep. Lots of little narrow switchbacks all the way to the top. Well, to the half top. And after about an hour of hiking, I made it to the top of the Scout Lookout. Now up here, there's a nice little plateau where you can have a picnic. There's restrooms up here as well. And then there's this. This is the final part of Angel's Landing. This is the part where people go up on the chains to the top. Uh, so that's the one you need the permit for. But honestly, the views from here too. This is just like the Scout Lookout and there's more of the trail. This is up like five minutes more on the trail to see up here. And boy, let me tell you, it is steep down there and there's no railings. So this is where I give you my safety warning. Be careful. And little, little kids, maybe not so much on this trail, or at least to the top, top lookout. All right, well, now that I've admired the view for a little while, took it all in, didn't fall down, uh, it's time to head down the hill. And now the question is, is it worth it to come up here without the permit to go to Angel's Landing? Absolutely super rewarding to get up here. Uh, so even if you don't get the permit to Angel's Landing, still do this hike to the scout lookout. All right, after the hike, I've worked up an appetite. What's for lunch today? The Zion cheeseburger from the Zion Lodge. 13 bucks. Mm. Big meat patty, juicy. Pretty good deal, I think. That cheeseburger was so much better than the one I had in Bryce Canyon City. I mean, not an In-N-Out Burger or a Shake Shack, but still pretty good. I was able to go back to my car over there, change my jacket, and change my shoes just to get new socks and new shoes that aren't 
wet from the hike, which is another nice part about staying here in the lodge. Now let's head over to the Temple of Sinawava and the Narrows, the other main hike in the canyon. All right, so here we are on the River Sidewalk Trail, aptly named because it runs right along the river. From the last shuttle stop, this is 1.1 miles, which will then bring us to the Narrows, which is where people actually go in the river. And I think what's really cool about walking this trail is just how close to these cliffs you get. I mean, to see those 3,000 foot cliffs from uh, so close, like really makes you feel the immensity. And as you walk, like the further you walk this way, the narrower and narrower the canyon gets. Oh, it's kind of funny on this trail, you can definitely tell the people that are gonna go hike the narrows because they're all the ones that are wearing those fancy overalls. At the end of the 1.1 mile trail, there's a little staircase that comes down here to these rocks, and then there's a bunch of people standing around, and then there's a bunch of people going in the water. What's the difference? The people going in the water, they are doing the Narrows Walk. The people that are standing here, they are saying one of two things. They're saying, wow, those people are crazy, or they're saying, hey, that's really cool. Maybe I'll do that tomorrow with the right gear. Actually, and some people even tried it without the right gear. I, I wouldn't advise that. The rocks are pretty slippery and uh, they, they didn't get very far. All right, well, now that I've been to the end of the path, I've seen the Narrows, I've now said to myself, next time I come to Zion, I'm actually gonna do it, because I talked to a couple of fellow explorers who just went in there with their eight-year-old son, so when the Curious Princess gets four more years on her, she can come to the Narrows too. That might be our revisit rate to Zion again. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna walk back on this river trail for a mile to the shuttle, back to the lodge, and then Las Vegas. Here we go. Well, the shuttle bus had a little bit of a line. I had to wait for a couple shuttles, but once we got on, we saw some big horn sheep on the way. That was pretty cool. And now I am in the car, Las Vegas Strip in three hours. All right, after about an hour on the road, we're on the Interstate 15, and here on the right, we welcome see the sign Arizona. that says, welcome to Arizona, and Google helping me out as well. And it's sort of interesting how this Interstate 15 works. You go from Utah, a little bit into Arizona, and then finally in Nevada. And then we see from the sign right above us here, 40 minutes to the Nevada state line, 108 to Las Vegas. And at just about mile marker 23, we're crossing a river. Can you read that sign? The Virgin River, the same river that we saw in the Narrows of Zion. Wow, and this section of the Interstate 15 actually feels a lot like going through that Zion Scenic Drive. These uh, cliffs are really tall, and as you can imagine, no cell phone service here. And now with 85 miles left to go of the drive, we are in Nevada. And you know how we know we're in Nevada? I mean, not just because Google said we're in Nevada, but because what's right across the state line? Yes, there's a casino over there on the right. Yes, the first thing you see as you cross into Nevada is a casino. And what's it called? The Virgin River Casino. Zion is following us around. Now, of course, what's extra funny about those casinos right on the border between Nevada and Arizona is that for the next, like, 80 miles, there's nothing between there and Vegas. Such is the same thing on the California-Nevada border, a series of casinos, and then nothing for a long time. But I did have to make one quick pit stop on the way at Terrible's gas station and casino. That's right, why? Well, because they had a big sign that said clean restrooms. That's why I need to make a rest stop. The restrooms are clean, the mini mart is huge, and yes, inside there is a casino with slot machines. Oh, and they also sell Area 51 beef jerky because I guess beef jerky is better if it's made by aliens. And with 20 miles left to go of the drive, descending into the Las Vegas Basin, I can see the Las Vegas Strip over there on the left-hand side. The stratosphere and the new sphere, highly visible from back here, as is the Ferris wheel. I know they're tiny on your screen, but this is one of those like scale things to think about. You can see the Las Vegas Strip from 20 miles away. Impressive. Here we are on the Las Vegas Strip one of the cool man-made wonders of the world. I've seen some pretty neat views over the last couple days. This one's equally as impressive. And here we are at the Venetian. Now, 
just to park. The check-in line was a little long, but after 10 minutes, I got my room keys, and here we are in room 12528, 12th floor, Venetian tower. It's a big room that I'm gonna show you in a second, but first, let's start with the bathroom. We've got a double sink right here, big mirror, big soaking tub, another big mirror, shower. It's got a little makeup table over here. The toilet's in this door behind this mirror into the room. What I love about the Venetian rooms is like the double area, the sleeping area, and then the living area. Big bed, big impressive headboard down here. We've got the seating area with a big sofa, a desk. There's two televisions in the room, one there, one there. And what do I look at outside? Da, 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 the Ferris wheel, the link right there. All right, that's my quick room tour, full room review coming out soon. All right, now I'm hungry, so let's go get something to eat. All right, well, on my way to dinner, I couldn't help but stop to watch the Mirage volcano erupt because it's not gonna be with us much longer. The Mirage is turning into the Hard Rock Hotel, and so if you're coming to Vegas, make sure to see that volcano while it's still here on the hour nightly. All right, after seeing that volcano explode one last time, I stopped at Caesar's Palace to check out the new chicken guy. This is a chicken sandwich spot by Guy Fieri. I got the chicken sandwich, mac and cheese, and a drink for $31. Those are Vegas strip price for you. It's like dinner at the El Bar. Well, you know, the strip tonight, let me tell you, is so lively. The eve before New Year's Eve, so many people are here, it's so busy. What do I want to do? Go to sleep, because I've had so many early mornings and so much hiking, I'm gonna turn in and I'll see you on New Year's Eve. All right, it is 7 p.m., T minus five hours to the new year to 2024. I'm just walking through MGM Grand and the casino is it's quite busy. Everybody either wants to be a winner before 2024 or get in their gambling losses for their tax returns before the new year. Either way, I am headed over to New York, New York, where I'm going to have my New Year's Eve dinner. What's it gonna be? What do you think? All right, put in your bets. Maybe you could win. Let's find out. And now they're just starting to close the strip down to traffic in every way they know how, with buses diagonally and trucks. They're gonna make sure nobody gets through here. And looking the other way on this strip, it is so weird to see the strip completely devoid of cars. Descending down the escalator into the New York, New York, it is busy here too. And you know, between the MGM Grand and the New York, New York, if I was choosing where to stay, I think it would be here. The MGM Grand just feels a little sad now. All right, so what's for dinner at Greenberg and Sons Deli? A pastrami sandwich on rye and a matzo ball soup. It's hard to find a pastrami sandwich. I should say, it's hard to find a good pastrami sandwich outside of New York, and these ones are pretty delish. All right, 7.30, how does the strip look now? It is entirely closed to traffic on both sides. Just police cars on the strip now. All right, it is five minutes to New Year's Eve and it is definitely busy here out on the Las Vegas Strip. I've never seen this many people out here before. Where did I decide to stand? A little spot right by the gondola down here where I've got a nice, uh, nice thing to lean on and look up at the sky. I'm like, look at all these people. People over there, people up there, people on that bridge, people, people, people. 400,000 people tonight on the strip. And now two minutes prior to the new year, spontaneous cheering. What are we cheering about? We're just cheering. Yay. All right, and the Venetian screen starts a countdown. 45 seconds to the new year. Volcanoes erupting. And you know, boy, is it loud. Not just the kazoos, the fireworks, because they're not just the Treasure Island. Nine hotels and right above my head at the Venetian. All right, that was a pretty amazing eight minutes of fireworks. Now it's time to follow the mob, head back into the hotel and turn in. The beauty of staying right here on the Strip.
don't have to fight the crowds or the traffic to get back home. All right, back in my room here at the Venetian, and I don't think I can end this vlog on any higher note than that. So fellow explorers, if you enjoyed this ultra long road trip vlog, please let me know that you made it here to the end. I really appreciate it. I'll make more like this when more people let me know they love it and they made it to the end. If you want to check out some more of my videos from the road trip, I'll be publishing guides on the Grand Canyon, Zion, Bryce, those hotel reviews. As soon as they're done, I'll put them up here on the screen. Until then, I'll put some of my Las Vegas videos because those are definitely done. All right, well, fellow explorers, as usual, I won't say goodbye because I'll see you in one of those videos.